Now, what's the reaction from the international community? Well, the U.S., South Korea, and Japan have reacted positively, if somewhat in a guarded way. President Trump tweeted, North Korea has agreed to suspend all nuclear tests and close up a major test site. This is very good news for North Korea and the world. Big progress. Look forward to our summit. South Korea's presidential office released this statement. We welcome North Korea's decision to discard its nuclear test site and to suspend the launch tests of mid-range missiles. North Korea's decision is a meaningful progress for denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, which the world wishes for. And here's Japan's prime minister. He called it a positive mood, but he added this note of caution. The only thing that is important is whether or not it will lead to the completely verified and irreversible ab abolition of nuclear missiles. We would like to keep a close eye on it. Let's see whether my panel thinks this is for real. Adam Mount of the Federation of American Scientists is in Washington. He joins us now. He's former director of the North Korea Task Force at the Council on Foreign Relations. We also have Paul Carroll with us uh, with the nuclear disarmament group N-Square. Adam, North Korea has tricked the international community many times before. I was looking at the timeline just before coming on. I mean, I, I count at least three times in the 90s and the early 2000s when they made a promise to start winding down their nuclear capability and then and then it turned out not to be genuine. Is this another trick? Well, North Korea is certainly not trustworthy in international negotiations. As you say, they've got a long track record of turning back on statements that they've made. And it's important to realize that this statement is really very carefully circumscribed. Uh, it's a proposal to shape North Korea's nuclear arsenal, not to eliminate it. No reference is made to short-range ballistic missiles, to uh, fissile material, to submarine-launched ballistic missiles or space-launched vehicles. Uh, these are tricks that, for example, have scuttled um, negotiations uh, in the past, uh, most recently in 2012. So it's important that President Trump and other American diplomats go into this with carefully measured expectations, that they let the State Department expertise back into the room who are going to tell them that uh, precisely um, what Kim Jong-un has in mind here, uh, it's not all um, it's not everything that we want to hear. In fact, we're still miles away from what Washington mm -hmm. would demand. Paul, a very big picture. Um, if you break this down to its simplest elements, the Washington wants to get rid of the nuclear threat in North Korea. And until now, the consensus among analysts was that North Korea wanted to keep its nuclear capability. Can this fundamental difference be reconciled? In the long term, absolutely, it can be reconciled. I think uh, I completely agree with Adam. What we're seeing right now, really, is a little bit of a, a kabuki play. Uh, from my perspective, North Korea has the upper hand so far in the lead up to both the North-South summit next Friday and the planned Trump-Kim Jong-un summit sometime later this spring or early summer. What I mean by that is they're dangling what seem like concessions before the international community. They're talking about things that five or six years ago would have seemed like breakthroughs, no more nuclear tests, no more missile tests. But that was at a point in time when their programs were nascent. And today, even though they may be rudimentary, they seem to have enough confidence that they have the type of nuclear weapons and delivery systems that are enough to give pause to Korea, Japan, the United States. And I would say that is true. And so they've already got the hand they want to play, and they're dangling sort of, you know, the two of clubs before us, and we're getting all excited about it. Well, that's what, really, what we, yeah, what we ahead, need sorry. to do is, is square the circle and keep in mind, as you said, their core interest is security, and they see nuclear weapons as the guarantor of that. Until they have a path out where they're willing to feel secure without their nuclear weapons, we're not going to get very far. Is it, is it possible, Paul, still with you, is it possible to guarantee security? I mean, what would that even look like? Well, what that would look like is, from the North Korean and, frankly, the South Korean perspective, something more formal and, and more flushed out than the 1953 armistice agreement. So like that a non-aggression treaty where the U.S. promises never to invade, never to bomb them, never to attack? I, exactly. In fact, for years they've used, this, used the phrase, the U.S. must suspend its hostile policy. What does that mean exactly? But they would, hold on, they would trust time. this? They would trust a treaty? They would trust a, tr a piece of paper from the U.S. at this stage? I, I wouldn't say a piece of paper. I would say a multilateral process 
that is consistent and has a mm. tempo of meetings and presence, not mm. just tweets. Adam, for months we have been saying that most likely North Korea is testing its nuclear capability and missiles because it wants to ultimately negotiate from a place of strength. Is that what's happening right now? Well, that's a leading contender at this point. Uh, North Korea's statement today does give some credence to that view. Uh, we should read this not as uh, a small regime that's been cowed into denuclearization. Really what it reads like is a nuclear power uh, that is making an arms control proposal. So that would lend legitimacy to Kim Jong-un's cause. Uh, it, that's really what they've been seeking this whole time. Uh, so that's plausible. Um, you know, I'm still skeptical that they choose to eliminate their nuclear and missile program, certainly not on the uh, timetable that John Bolton has argued for. There's really no realistic chance that, that North Korea is a nuclear-free nation by Christmas. So really we're going to be in this for the longer haul. It's going to be a multi-step process, and the first step should be to codify clarify and then verify these declarations that were made today and to really plug the gaps in in that declaration so that it's not a partial cap on North Korea's nuclear advancements and capabilities but rather it's a hard cap um, so Donald Trump can't go into this expecting complete surrender he has to have a plan to codify and clarify these uh, these declarations expand them and then to move on from there speaking of Donald Trump Paul is his strategy of maximum pressure working at this stage? Do you feel that what we're seeing is perhaps the result of Kim Jong-un feeling the economic pressure on his country? Well, I, I'm not sure I would agree that, that the current administration has a strategy. They've certainly gone all in with sticks and abandoned any carrots. Well, what about the UN sanctions? Hold on. Everybody I've spoken to on this show tells me the recent sanctions over the last few months that have been implemented against North Korea have had more bite to them than prior sanctions. I, I would agree with that, but it, they've only been a few months old, and the, these kinds of sanctions take time to really have the impact they were designed to have, and it's, it's not clear to me that China in particular is going to have the wherewithal to enforce and really um, toe the line on those sanctions over the long t over the long term. And keep in mind, Kim Jong Un recently went to Beijing, and it's unclear to me what exactly was discussed or promised or committed to at that meeting. That that to me is a big X factor in all of these negotiations. Adam, what kind of price uh, would Kim Jong Un want, or what kind of price would Washington have to pay for? Uh, engaging on uh, towards denuclearization. I mean, Paul mentioned earlier perhaps promising non-aggression, right? That there would be no attack from the U.S. on North Korea. But we also know from his public pronouncements, Kim Jong Un is very focused on the state of his economy. Right. This is this is the sixty-four thousand dollar question. Uh, there is not going to be an easy answer here. Uh, John Bolton's idea that he can. Uh, jet set into the into the summit and ask where to pull American ships into to load the nuclear program onto them. Uh, that's a that's a fantasy. That's never going to happen. Uh, we need to be prepared for fallback positions to counteract various North Korean tricks and traps. Uh, you know to have all of that planned out and prepared for. But we also, as you say, need to be come prepared with something to offer. And that has not been Donald Trump's strong suit in negotiations. That's not how John Bolton thinks about it. Um, security assurances would have to be part of it. But you'd have to, you have to remember that those would mean that Kim Jong-un would have to trust a leader that he's condemned to death in public statements. So it's unlikely that uh, simple assurances are going to matter. Uh, it's unlikely that economic payoffs are going to be enough. What I think is happening is that uh, Kim Jong-un is stalling for time. He's going to try to let these negotiations um, stall and drag on through the summer and fall. Uh, and in, in the same way, try to get Donald Trump to either give up something for nothing, so give up something substantial in terms of deterrent posture or alliance cohesion, uh, or to get China to ease up on sanctions. So if Trump rock, walks away from the table first because he has unrealistic expectations, they come out way ahead. All right, Adam Mount, Paul Carroll, thank you very much. It's been very useful tapping into your expertise. Appreciate talking to you today. Thanks. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.